Hi guys and welcome to this edition of Grade 11 Population Ecology. Today we're going to look at population ecology. It's part of your Grade 11 syllabus. It's very important for you to understand the concepts involved here. Let's get straight into it. So I'm going to have a brief discussion today about the topic. We're going to look at uh, summary notes and then we're going to go on to looking at some questions, some questions from previous years. And I think that's the best way to look at this topic. Let's, let's get straight into it, guys. So we're looking at the key concepts today. Factors that determine the population growth, we're going to look at them. We're also going to look at some of the methods that are important in determination, in determining the size of a population. Very important after that would be the different population interactions or social interactions that occur within the environment. And I think that we've got to understand. So we're looking at the biosphere, we're looking at population ecology today, we're looking at social interaction between organisms, and we're also looking at how to determine the, f the factors that regulate the population size. So there's lots of concepts, lots of terminology. In the notes, guys, you're going to find a whole list of vocab or the terminology which you guys can refer to constantly. We're going to also put down some summary notes in the, note in, in these, in the, in the presentation notes so that you can very quickly refer to them during the course of your lessons and your planning. So let's look at what we have in store today. So we're looking at the introduction. Let's look at what the introduction is. So the word, the world consists of pockets of ecosystems within a biosphere. So we often refer to the biosphere as the world where we have living things interacting with the environment. Each of the ecosystems contain various species of organisms. So we're going to look at various species of organisms and how they depend on each other. They depend on each other for their survival. And we know that if a species becomes extinct, it has an effect on the entire ecosystem. The survival of all living organisms depends on sustainability of the environment as well as social organization within the population and the community. This dynamic balance ensures that ecosystem functions successfully at the various species within it survive and able to interact. So it's quite a very broad introduction to it, but we're dealing with the social interactions between organisms. We're looking at the interdependence. We're looking at how they share resources so that they live sustainably. And the word sustainable comes, comes up quite often from grade 10. In terms of, it is the relationship that exists between organisms and the environment that ensures their survival. And we know that organisms are often interdependent on each other, and the extinction of one can lead to the detrimental effect of others. So we're going to spend some time discussing the interaction between organisms as well. We're also going to look at the factors that control the population growth. And these we refer to as population parameters. So let's look at what population parameters are. These are factors that affect the population by either increasing or decreasing the population size. So when we talk of population parameters, we're referring to parameters that either or factors that increase or decrease the population size. The size and the, depend the density of the population is expressed in numbers or biomass. If we look at what the definition of biomass is, guys, it is determined by multiplying the number of organisms with the average mass of the individuals in the population. So the word biomass basically is an indication of the number of organisms or the size of the population. If we define the term population, which we'd li I'd like to do before we get onto this, a population, there are three distinguishing parts or terms that we need to have. It refers to the number of individuals in a given area that can interbreed and produce offspring that are fertile. And that's fundamentally important. They, have, they belong to the same species, they're in a given area, and they interbreed and produce fertile offspring. And that's essentially what is a population. So when we look at factors that affect the population numbers, we're going to look at the factors in terms of how they would either increase, decrease, or cause the population to remain around a, a, a constant level or equilibrium. So let's look at some of the notes we have in store. So very quickly, if we were to discuss the, the factors that increase the population, we know that population factors that that cause the, or factors that cause the population to increase would be the birth rate, or we refer to that as natality, as well as immigration. Immigration, guys, is the inward movement into a population. So when organisms immigrate into a closed population, here we've got a box indicating the population within a closed area, and these are the factors that contribute to the increase in the population. So when we have the birth rate increasing, or when we have organisms moving into an, into an closed ecosystem or an environment, you find that the population numbers increase. 
We have that through seasonal migration. We have that through reproduction that, hap that happens on a, cycle, on a cycling basis, which leads to the population increasing in numbers. We also have factors that lead to the decrease of the population. And we refer to these as either the, the death rate or mortality and emigration. Again, we find there's a population, and these are the factors that contribute to the decrease in the population. So mortality refers to the death rate and emigration. And often learners are confused between immigration and emigration. E4, exit. So these would be organisms that exit an ecosystem. This could be due to a lack of resources where organisms tend to move out. They look for areas with more, re with more resources, and that would lead to a decrease in the population. It also happens seasonally when conditions change. It could happen during, um, it could happen during uh, the winter months. It could happen during summer when the conditions are unfavorable or when there's a lack of resources. And these are, t these are two factors that contribute to the decrease in the population size. So if we look at stability of a population, often an indication of a healthy population would be how stable the population is. And often we use two words to describe the stability of a population. We use the words carrying capacity, which I've highlighted here, as well as the words environmental resistance. So if we were to talk about environmental resistance and carrying capacity, if we briefly defer to these terms, carrying capacity. Now, carrying capacity will refer to the maximum number of individuals that can be accommodated in a given area. We know that, for example, Kruger National Park would have a ca carrying capacity of the number of elephants. Beyond that, that number, we would be exceeding the area's carrying capacity. This would have an impact on the organisms. This would have an impact on the ecosystem. And hence, we refer to that as the carrying capacity, which simply means the maximum number of individuals that can be accommodated in a given area. Okay. The term environmental resistance, guys, if we break this up, resistance means an opposition to. Environment would be relating to the environment. So often we find that in a given area, an area would have a carrying capacity. When the population size increases beyond that carrying capacity, the environment offers resistance. Resistance is not a physical force. It is an expression of the environment's pressure on the, on the growing population. And that could be by a lack of resources. It could be due to a lack of space. So we're going to discuss how Stability of a population is affected by the carrying is is affected by increasing number of individuals or decreasing number of individuals and how the concepts carrying capacity and environmental resistance come in. Okay, so carrying capacity will change according to food supply, competition, seasonal weather patterns, and the impact of diseases. And we find that this would influence the number of individuals in an area. As I said, organisms will tend to move out of an area or into an area depending on the availability of resources, depending on the weather patterns, depending on the impact of diseases in an environment. And that's part of the natural cycle of organisms in an area. We can classify these different factors into two different groups, density dependent factors and density independent factors. What do we mean by the word density? Now, if we look at a country like India or China, where there are lots of people living in there, we find that it is a dense population. We, loose, we loosely use the word highly dense area. What does that density actually refer to? It refers to the number of individuals in a unit, in a given unit area. The more the individuals in a small area, the more dense it is. The more sparse the population is in the sense that the fewer individuals are present in a given area, the less dense it is. So we have factors that affect the population based on the density of the number of individuals in that area or the factors that are independent of the number of individuals in that area. So we're going to constant we're going to look at density as a descript as a definition very quickly. Density describes the number of individuals in a population. This refers this could be in the same area in a specific time. The factors that regulate population growth are called density dependent factors. Factors that are independent of them, not related to the population density, are called density independent factors. So we've got to look at these two here. As I said, there are two types of factors we can classify them into, density dependent and density independent. Let's look at some factors and classify them based on the number of individuals in an area or based on independent of the number of individuals in an area. Okay. So if we describe density dependent factors, these factors prevent 
overpopulation. They maintain a stable population. Large population numbers will cause an increase in mortality, causing the population density to decrease. So as we have an increase in mortality, the death rate increases. That will bring the population number down. The population stabilizes and the carrying capacity is maintained. And that's part of the natural cycle of in an, in an environment. The population constantly increases. If it goes above the carrying capacity, the environment offers resistance. Lots of individuals or few will die out due to a lack of resources, lack of space. It allows the population to re-establish and the area to re-establish. And that is what we call a fluctuation around the carrying capacity. The need will increase as the population increases and approaches carrying capacity. Density dependent factors are the following. Let's look at them very quickly. Food and water, competition, space and shelter, predation and disease. All of these five factors, guys, will increase when the density of a population increases. So in, in, think in terms of when you have lots of individuals in a given, in a small area. You're going to find that disease becomes, will easily spread, it's easily contagious. You find that competition for food, predation increases. Due to a lack of, due to too many individuals competing for resource, it becomes difficult for them to survive. You find that mortality will increase. Space and shelter also becomes a, a problem. Food and water is the essential resource needed. And when you have too many individuals sharing food and water, it becomes an issue of survival of the strongest, and hence the population will decrease. Okay, so let's look at the density independent factors. Again, the term density independent refers to factors that are independent of the number of individuals. And that's the best way to remember it. Factors that are independent of the number of individuals. So regardless of the number of individuals in a population, the population will be affected. And that often happens when you have natural catastrophes, when there's changes in the climate. What do we mean by natural catastrophes? If you think about tsunamis, earthquakes, volcanoes, mudslides, uh, the, the eruptions of a volcano can lead to massive destruction. Uh, felt fires that can clean out an environment can destroy a population. So these are factors that are independent of the population. So irrespective of the number of individuals, if there was a tsunami or an earthquake, irrespective of the number of individuals, it will affect the population and you'll have lots of individuals dying out and the mortality rate increasing. And that's how we classify the factors that affect population into density dependent and density independent factors. We also need to discuss population growth and we'll look at some examples later on. Basically there are two types of growth curves. We're looking at our geometric growth patterns as well as our logistic growth patterns. And basically we're looking at, and some of us like to call them the S-shaped curve and the J-shaped curve. Basically these show different phases of growth in a population based on how they adapt to the environment and how they grow. Okay, so we're going to look at some examples in a little while. I'm going to take the logistic growth pattern and discuss very briefly these different stages that we need to know. So there are a few stages that we need to know. It's the initial lag phase. And if I were to draw a little graph here on the side, we often find the initial lag phase which represents that area there. I'm going to change my pen to illustrate. The accelerated or geometric growth phase would be this phase of the graph here. And that phase would mean that there's lots of resources, individuals reproduce faster, they've acclimatized, they've adapted to the environment. We then get the third phase, which is called the decelerated growth phase, which simply means that there is an increase in the population, but the rate of increase decreases, which simply means that it is not increasing as fast as it er originally was. It, its increase is there, but at a much slower level. We then get the next phase, which is called the equilibrium phase, and that is the phase when the population fluctuates around its carrying capacity. That's the maximum number of individuals that can be accommodated. And if it does exceed that, we get to the last phase, and that is called the, and it's the death phase, and we will see that the population numbers decrease. This, class, this typical shape here, guys, I'm going to highlight this in yellow. This typical shape here is referred to the S-shaped curve or the logistic growth curve. The J-shaped curve, if I just scroll down a bit, the J-shaped curve, I'm going to represent that immediately directly below that, would be a curve that can be depicted with a initial lag phase and accelerated growth phase and then a, sometimes a drastic extinction phase. And this is how a J-shaped curve would look. So that's the J-shaped curve 
and that's the S-shaped curve. And that's very quickly looking at the different growth curves. Let's go on to a very important aspect in population ecology would be determining the number of individuals in that. Basically, it's very important for us to establish the size of a population. Why is it done? It's done so that we understand what the, what the resources are available to that population is, whether that area can sustain the growth. Uh, human senses are done to determine how to plan for the future. And this, it's fundamentally important for, for, for individuals to be able to calculate the growth of a population, determine the number of individuals in there. It's often very difficult, and hence we have two types of techniques. We have the direct technique, which refers to physically counting every individual in the population, as well as we have an indirect technique, which is sort of a random sampling where we count few individuals and we then uh, do a few, uh, we do some calculations and we try and extrapolate what the, what uh, calculate what the actual or the approximate number of the actual population would be. So we're going to look at briefly dense di the direct techniques. In the direct techniques, we use the census method. And the census method basically is a physical count of every individual in a population. It's very difficult to do that with very small animals. You find that it, you need to be able to uh, sample a population that is large. They inhabit a fixed area and they can be counted quickly and easily. So if we were to survey the number of elephants in the Kruger National Park, for example, we'd be able to do that. We'd be able to physically count the number of elephants because they're quite large. Uh, it's a fixed area, so we look at the area, there's boundaries, there's borders within which the elephants do not move in and out. So we have control in terms of the area. And also this can be done very quickly and easily. Quickly and easily in terms of using aerial photographs, flying by uh, with, a, with a helicopter and probably taking out aerial photographs and then being able to count them. And that would be a direct count. For humans, we do a census and that's done. Uh, we just had a census last year in which we determined the the population of South Africa and that was a physical count of every individual. So these are important direct techniques of counting the individuals. It's used for large organisms that are in a fixed area and that can be easily and quickly counted. Okay, it cannot be done for organisms that are extremely small, that are evasive, that are hard to get to, access to. Let's look at the indirect technique and that's often, here we're looking at two, we're looking at two different techniques but this would involve counting a few individuals in the sample and then using different formula to calculate the actual size or an approximate size of the population. So I think it's very important for us to spend some time looking at the indirect technique. Okay, so it's used to estimate the population size. Samples of the individuals are counted accurately and then the total population is calculated using a simple formula. There are two common types of te indirect techniques. One is the quadrant method and the other is the mark recapture method. I'm going to very quickly go on to the quadrant method and basically describe to you what happens in a quadrant method. So often a quadrant method involves counting the number of individuals found in a one meter by one meter square. So a little quadrant is placed in that you have little squares and the number of individuals are randomly counted in various little quadrats within this quadrant. And that is how it is determined. It's often used for, num for organisms that are stationary, that are very small, for example, daisies in a field, or the number of grass and weeds in a given area. Okay, it's used to determine the species density, which simply means the number of individuals found in a given area, or the frequency of a species, or how often a species occur in a given area. It can be used to determine more than one the, the population size of more than one species at a given time, which is quite a, 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 a unique uh, characteristic of this type of method. Obviously, there's a formula involved, guys, and you've got to remember the formula. Uh, it's often needed. It's quite simple. And I would, if I were you, I'll write this formula down and learn it because the examiner may give it to you. He may not give it to you. If he gives it to you, it's very easy. You have your data. You put it into the formula, and you calculate. If not, you've got to remember the the, the formula, it always helps to remember guys so that you understand exactly what you, you're doing. So numbers in the sample are counted. That is multiplied by the total size of the area. So if it's a, so if you measured, it's 100 meters squared, suppose you've measured an area 100 meters squared and if you've counted 20 individuals in there and if you've got the size of your quadrant is 10 meters squared, for example guys, we'd be able to work out the population size of this. That's a very random example. That's 200 
in that area. So there's 20 counted in the sample and that we got from counting the individuals in the various blocks as I've indicated there. And then we take the total area of the area that you're sampling and that if that's 100 square meters and the size of the quadrant and that could be 10 meters squared or it could be a 1 meter squared quadrant and that is how you get your answer. Well, we're going to look at some examples later on, just an introduction to this. Okay, so let's move on to uh, the, another indirect technique, and that is called the mark recapture method. Now, this simply very involves marking a few individuals, capturing them, marking them, releasing them. We then catch them after a little while, and we count the number of individuals that have been marked in that, and the number of the total. And we put that into a formula, and this method is known as the Peterson's Index Formula. And there's it right here. We catch a few individuals to estimate the number, which is n. The total number of individuals in catch 2 would be c. The total number of marked individuals in catch 1 would be m. And the total number of individuals caught in the second sample is r. And that is used to determine the population size. This method is used when to mark. So we mark a few individuals. We catch a few individuals. We mark them. We release them. We then allow them to mix freely with the rest of the population. After a period of time, we capture the second sample and we count the number of individuals both marked and unmarked in that. And we then use the formula called the Peterson's Index Formula to determine the population size. So it's quite a good technique. There are some limitations which we will discuss in a while. But the, the idea of this is that it gives us a good estimate of the population size of organisms that are not very easily uh, visible that you cannot count very easily or that you cannot catch and capture very easily or physically see them. They are often used for organisms that move fast, that live in areas that are not easily accessible. Okay, so we're going to look at some sample questions during the session. We're going to go through the questions and we're going to very quickly look at how we can apply, apply all those concepts and terminology into this. So again, multiple choice guys. This is where you should be scoring your marks. Various possible answers are provided in each question. Indicate the correct answer by writing only the letter of your choice next to the relevant question number. What I'm going to do is I'm going to circle the correct answers for you as I go through them. So a population consists of, and if you know the definition of population, it refers to the number of individuals of the same kind. So it's individuals of the same kind. And that's essentially what you've got to remember. And I said this at the start. A population it refers to the number of individuals belonging to the same species in a given area that can interbreed and produce offspring that are fertile. And that would be individuals of the same kind would be a population. Different species, definitely not. Community of different organisms, no. Different ecosystems, not. Okay. Let's move on to 1.2. Which of the following represents a population? So the question is, which of the following represents a population. We've got to read through the options before we decide. Different types of animals in a nature reserve. When we refer to different types of animals in a nature reserve, that will not be population. That will be a community, and hence that is incorrect. Cats and dogs in the backyard of your home. Guys, cats and dogs belong to different species, and hence that cannot be a population. That would be wrong. All the fish in the sea. All the fish in the sea, guys. Although they fish, all of them belong to different species and hence that would be wrong. All the trout in the Var River, here we're seeing all the trout which refers to the same species and it's a given area is the Var River. So it's, not, it's very specific, it's the area and the number of sp specific organisms which are in this case the trout and so the answer here would be D and D would be correct. So you've got to read your options, guys. So lots of, lots of you might be enticed into saying all the fish in the sea because fish ref refers to the same organism. But don't be caught out. It's going, it's, fish do not necessarily represent the same species. So that was a nice question. Let's move on to some more multiple choice questions. Okay, well, these are terminologies that we've got to look at. So let's look at this. Give the correct biological term for each of the following descriptions. What we've got to write only the term next to the relevant question number. So if we look at the terminology here, well, let's look at that very quickly. The phase during population growth. So we're referring to a phase during population growth where animals adapt to their new environment. And if we go back, this represents, this is a question that comes from growth curves. And that phase of adaptation often occurs, if I were to draw the two graphs, we've got 
the J-shaped graph there and here we've got the S-shaped graph. So the phase during which they adapt would be those phases there and that is the lag phase. Okay, so it's the lag phase. It's the phase during which where the organisms adapt, they're acclimatizing themselves to the new environment, they're becoming sexually mature before they actually start increasing the population size by reproducing. So that's the lag phase. Let's look at 1.2.2. The maximum number of organisms of a particular kind that can be supported by resources in an environment. I've discussed this term initially during the introduction. So when we refer to the maximum number of individuals that can be supported in an area, we're referring to the base, the carrying capacity of that area. So the answer for this would be the carrying capacity. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Question 1.2.3. The natural ability of a population size to increase, the population increase in size, and that would be, we looked at population parameters. So we said there were two factors that cause populations to increase. Immigration, which is moving into the population, as well as natality. Natality refers to the birth rate. So the natural ability, guys, would be, in a closed population, would be natality, which refers to the natality which is the basically the birth rate okay so that's we've got that let's look at 1.2.4 one directional movement of organisms into a population so when organisms move into a population again it's a population parameter factor that we're looking at when organisms move in one direction into a population remember I said the word inward initially and that was the key word that I'd, I'd use to remember. So it's immigration is the answer. So when organisms move immigration into a population, it, a one-way movement is called immigration. Okay, let's look at the next question, 1.2.5. A population without immigration and migration. When you find an area where there's no inward movement or organisms moving out of that, we simply can refer to that as a closed population, which simply means that the population would only increase based on the number of individuals reproducing or death or dying out. So this would refer to a term known as a closed population. So when organisms live, when a population is in an enclosed area, it will only increase or decrease based on natality and mortality and not on immigration and emigration. Let's look at the next question. 1.2.6. Determine the population, determining the population size by counting all the organisms. When we count all the organisms, guys, the only possible way to count all of them is to physically count them. And that would be a direct count method. So we can answer this by saying a direct count or a census. So census, guys, would be physically counting organisms, each and every individual. Or if you said the, these, sorry, I'm going to erase that. Or if you said a direct count, you would be correct. So that's the end of the terminology. We get a, the next type of question, guys. In this year, you've got to be cautious. This is a question where you have a column one and a column two. And the instructions here, are we, there are statements that are given in column two. We've got to look at whether both of them apply to the statements in column one, whether one only or neither. And it's often very, it's not as easy as we assume them to be. They're often tricky. You've got to read the, the statement in column one and look at whether both apply, one applies, or neither of the statements apply. And often you get learners losing marks here because they tend to rush in, look at the obvious, and then write down the answers. So spend some time, read these options out clearly and understand the question before you decide to put a pen, uh, put your answer down on your paper. So I'm going to read the statement, I'm going to read the instructions. Each of the phrases in column one state whether it applies to A only, B only, both A and B, or none. So there's four possible options that we could write for each of the answers. Write down A only, B only, both A and B, or none in your answer booklet. So let's look at what our first question is. So question number one, in the maximum number of individuals that an environment can sustain. We've got two terms here. The terms that we're looking at is called natality and carrying capacity. Now, 
If we refer to natality, natality refers to the birth rate. So that's the birth rate. It's got nothing to do with the population uh, carrying capacity. If we look at the second term, carrying capacity, remember that we refer to this as the maximum number of individuals that an environment can sustain. So the answer for this would be A would be wrong and B would apply. So the answer for this would be B only. And you've got to weigh those, you've got to look at the options before you put your answer down. Let's look at the next one. So all we've given is direct technique and obviously this is a sampling method. So they are direct techniques. Let's look at it. Peterson's method and quadrat method. Now Peterson's method is a method using the smart recapture method. Now this is an indirect method. The quadrat method, guys, is also an indirect method because here we're looking at a quad and we randomly counting individuals in that. So it's not a direct method. So I'm going to say Peterson's method is incorrect, quadrat method is incorrect, and hence the answer for this would be none of these are correct. And hence you've got to eliminate the obvious. Let's look at the question, the third one. Displays exponential growth. So it's a statement, displays exponential growth. If we look at the two graphs again, the options that are given are geometric growth form and logistic growth form. Lots of the learners are going to be tempted to saying, well, exponential growth form is only in geometric growth curve. Now, read this very quickly, it's very, very carefully. It says displays exponential growth. If we look at the two graphs, guys, I'm going to draw them next to each other. We have the lag phase, and then we have that, and then we have that, and we have this. That's the J-shape. If we look at both these curves, both these curves show you this exponential growth phase. So displays exponential growth. So we see that in the S-shaped graph. We see that in the J-shaped graph. And hence, both A and B forms show exponential growth patterns. And hence, we can say the answer here would be both A and B. So we've read the options very carefully. And we've decided whether there was A, B, A or B, or none of them. And you've got to practice lots of these guys. Spend some time looking at the options and see if they do apply. Okay. We're going to look at question two very quickly. This question has been adapted from the March exams 2012. And this was paper two, question 1.2, 1.3. Get into the habit of looking at past year papers. It's a very good tool to be able to revise content. So spend some time, go through past papers, guys. This is where this question has been taken from. Give the correct biological term for each of the following descriptions. Again, we're looking at terminology, and I think it's fundamentally important, guys, that you spend lots of time understanding the concepts and the terms so that you can apply them to some questions. So let's look at 2.1.1. A series of changes that takes place during a life cycle of an insect. Now, you know that insects undergo lots of change from the time they develop to the time they become an adult. And that process of change is referred to as metamorphosis. So if we refer to the term, the series of changes in the life cycle, that will be metamorphosis. So you get either insects showing complete metamorphosis or incomplete metamorphosis. But the term that we needed to identify here was metamorphosis would be this would be a series of changes that occur in the development of an insect from from birth to the time it, till the time it becomes an adult. Okay, let's look at 2.1.2. The maximum size of a population that can be supported by a habitat under conditions prevailing at a particular time. Again, that's the word, that's the maximum size. So the maximum size will refer to the carrying capacity. Again, you're seeing lots of repetition. Again, it's very important because these are important concepts, and you'll find that they often come up in different questions. Mac carrying capacity. So it's very important for you to know this. Obviously, it's an important concept, and hence it's been, it's been tested often. Let's look at 2.1.3. The relationship between two species in which both benefit from their association. And this comes to social interaction. We get different types of symbiotic relationships where organisms benefit from each other, where one benefits while the other is harmed, where one benefits and the other is not harmed. Here we're talking of the interactions between organisms, and that we refer to as symbiosis. 
Let's look at this. This talks about two species in which both benefit. And we know that when both benefit, it is a mutual benefit. And hence, we refer to this term as mutualism. Some of the other terms that we refer to as commensalism, uh, parasitism, uh, and we look, okay, we'll look at them more probably in a few more in, 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 as we go through the options here. 2.1.4, the use of resources in a slightly different way by different species in the same habit, in the same habitat, allowing them to coexist. Okay. Now, when organisms share resources, this has got to do with organisms sharing resources so that they can coexist. And we refer to this as resource partitioning. So when a resource is shared between organisms so that they both benefit and can mutually survive, we refer to that term as resource partitioning. Partitioning. Okay. Let's look at the next question, 2.1.5. The variety of species of living organisms that exist on Earth, and that refers to any variety, refers to diversity, and living organisms would obviously mean bio. So, biodiversity. So, and that refers to the variety of living organisms that exist on Earth. 2.1.6. The elimination of one species by another in a habitat as a result of dependence on a common resource is called competitive exclusion. Now this is, the word exclusion comes in when, when one species competes with another to such a point that it utilizes all the resources to an extent that the other species that depends on that is excluded. And that we refer to as competition or competitive exclusion or competition exclusion. So where there's competition for a resource to such an extent that the species that the other species that depends on it is excluded from that area. So it's called competitive, competitive exclusion. When organisms compete and are then excluded from the habitat due to competition that exists between two different species. Let's look at 2.1.7. The killing of surplus animals by humans to avoid destruction of the natural environment. This is quite contro controversial. We often get the opinion-based questions on this, whether you agree with this or not agree. While this is controlled, it's unlike poaching. Here it's done so that the organisms that exist in that area can survive in that area without having the carrying capacity increased to such an extent that it could lead to the destruction of the environment and the extinction of that species. So this is when it's controlled, guys, it is referred to as culling. And this occurs seasonally when the, when the populations of organisms exceed the area's carrying capacity. You find that through human intervention, uh, the older ones are removed. An alternative to this could be translocation, but obviously you need to explore the, the cost effectiveness of this and obviously the, the trauma on the animals. And hence we can get into quite, a deba quite an argumentative uh, topic when it comes to culling versus uh, translocation uh, and the right to do that. So, but we will discuss this at an essay topic sometime later. The periodic movement out of and return to habitat by living organisms. When organisms move out, and return back, it is called migration. And you find that organisms will seasonally migrate to look for pastures that are greener, will look to look for areas to reproduce, and that is often seasonal. And then they return back to their habitat when conditions are conducive for them to survive. And that movement is referred to as migration. Let's look at the last term. A group of organisms sharing similar characteristics which are able to interbreed and produce fertile offspring. So this is a group of organisms. This does not necessarily refer to the number of organisms. When we see a group of organisms sharing characteristics and are able to interbreed and produce offspring, we refer to that as a species. That's the definition for species. So we've got to look at the definition for species properly and understand that there are three parts to it. That's one, two, and they're able to interbreed. That's a third part to the definition. So we've, we've done the terminology, we've spent some time looking at the terminology. We're going to spend some time looking at the second part of this question two in the exam. 
Again, it's at column A, column B, so let's look at it. We'll read through them very quickly and we'll come up with some answers. This would have no effect on the population size. What would have no effect on the population size? Immigration and migration. Both. Okay, none. I'll tell you why. Because the question says, which this would n have no effect. Immigration and emigration both have an effect. They cause the population size to increase or decrease, and hence none of these would have no effect on the population size. Let's look at the next question. Quite a tricky one, that one. A small portion of the population is counted and then used to work out the size of the whole population. Okay, uh, let's see. Census, guys, would be incorrect because it is a direct count of all the individuals. A simple sampling would be correct. It is part of the mark recapture method or the quadrat method where a small population is counted and then it is put into the into a formula to work out an approximate of the entire population. So let's look at the next one. Okay, competition between cows and goats for grass. Now, when cows and goats, com goats compete for grass, remember that they're competing for a common resource, but they are unrelated in terms of being uh, of the species, and hence the two different species that comp compete for a similar resource. The two terms that we need to associate with the c competition here for resource would be interspecific and intraspecific. When we refer to interspecific, it is like when you have your inter-school sports, it's one school against another school. So if you were to use the analogy of one school being another species and your school being one species, it would be interspecific. When you have competition within the school, like you have your inter-house, that is, would be intra, it's within the school. And hence that would be within a species. Here we're looking at two different species. Cows and goats belong to different species and hence it would be the interspecific inter competition, it will be A only. Okay, let's, let's look at some more of these. Okay, what do we call the relationship between two species where one species benefits and the other is harmed? Again, this is a type of symbiotic relationship. We spoke about mutualism early on. Here we're talking about a relationship in which one species benefits and the other is harmed. And you know that Parasitism is a classical example of where one species benefits and the other is harmed. Commensalism is when one species benefits and the other is not harmed or affected or benefits in either way. And hence, commensalism would not be correct. And the answer here would be A only. Let's look at the next one. A change in the composition of a species in the habitat that has never been habitat, habited by organisms before. So this is, this is a question that relates to succession. Here we're talking of an, an area that has never been inhabited before. When organisms establish themselves in that area, it's referred to as primary succession. If it was in an area where there was some life form before and the process of succession started all over again, that would be sec secondary succession. So in this case, secondary success, succession is not correct. And the only answer here would be A only. Okay, let's look at the next quest, the next, the last one in this year. The mature community of plants that remains relatively stable with few, if any, changes over a period of time, okay, remains stable over a period of time would refer to, and it's mature, guys, would refer to climax, and it would be B only. The reason why we're eliminating pioneer species is because these are relatively simple. These are establishing an ecosystem and they normally for a very short period in terms of the development of succession in that area. So the mature community in this time, in this case, which are relatively stable with very few changes would refer to the climax species inhabiting that area. So the answer there would be B only. Let's move on to some more questions. Again, Another option where we've got multiple choice and let's read them. Various possible answers are provided each for each question. Indicate the correct answer by writing only the letter of your choice next to the relevant question number. What I would do is I would circle the answers for you guys here so that we have an understanding of what the correct answer is. Which of the following serves as the best example of predation? Again, social interaction, guys. Predation is the relationship between a predator and a prey. Here we're going to look at a predator and a prey 
interacting with each other. So bees visiting a flower would not be a predator predation. Ticks on a dog is not. That's, that's a parasitism. A lion catching a zebra would be an example of predation. And a bird nesting in a tree, that would be an example of commensalism. So the answer here would be C. If you look at 3.1.2, which one of the following statements is true about the relationship between a predator and its prey? Now, if we look at the relationship between a predator, a predator is ov obviously a larger organism that relies on the smaller organisms for food. So we refer to that as a predator-prey relationship. We're going to look at some questions that depict or show graphically the, the relationship between a predator and a prey. So let's, let's, let's look at the options. A, there is, an in, there, there is interspecific competition. Which one of the following statements is true? So that's interspecific competition. That's true. The size of the predator population is density dependent and is controlled by the size of the prey population. That is also, let's read, an increased number of predators cause an increased number of prey. That's incorrect. The decreased number of predators cause a decrease in the number of prey. That's incorrect. That will cause an increase in the number of prey. So let's see. The options that we're looking at now, we've eliminated C, we've eliminated D. A and B seem quite, quite close and quite true, but we've got to give which one of the following is about relationship between a predator and a prey. Okay, so is it an interspecific competition? No, because they are not competing for a similar resource. Predators and prey do not compete for a similar resource. And hence, although they're different species, interspecific competition is for a common resource, and this is not true for them. So we eliminate that answer. And this would obviously be true if we read through that again. The size of the predator population is density dependent, and it's controlled by the size of the prey population, which simply means that the more prey available, the more the predator population would be. So that's a kind of density dependent factor where the population of the, of the predator is dependent on the density of prey in that area. So the answer there would be B. So that was quite a tricky one. Okay, so let's look at the rest of question 3.2. Give the correct biological term for each of the following descriptions. Write only the term next to the relevant question number. You'll see that we've been lots of different types of terminology questions on this here. They often come in multiple choice. They come in true and false. They come in columns. We've got to spend some time doing these and understand the terminology thoroughly. Let's look at the first question. An organism that only consumes plant material. We know that organisms can be divided into herbivores, carnivores, and omnivores. Herbivores would be eating exclusively plant material. A carnivore would be eating predominantly meat. An omnivore would be eating a diet both of plant matter as well as um, protein or animal matter. So an organism that feeds on plant material would be your herbivores. Okay, let's look at the next one. A group of organisms that live off dead organisms. So here we're talking of organisms that feed off dead decaying matter. So this would refer to as your sapro, saprophytes, P-H-Y, P, okay, I'm just going to rewrite that for you. So it's your, that's your sapro fights. Okay, let's look at the next one. A type of competition between members of the same species. As I discussed this early on, and that is in, within the species, so it's intra, same species, intraspecific competition. So it's interspecific competition. Competition between organisms that ensures that the best competitor stays in the environment and that is called competition between organisms that ensures that the best competitor stays in the environment. That's called um, competitive, competitive exclusion. Where the strong individuals survive and the, the weaker ones are eliminated from that, or excluded. Hence, we come up with the word exclusion. Let's look at the last one. Coexisting of lions and leopards in the same area. When lions and leopards coexist in that, they basically share resources. And sharing resources is very important in terms of them sustaining themselves. So we call that resource 
partitioning. And you often see this in, 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 in the wild where organisms hunt at different times. Uh, they, they feed, they share their resources at different times. Some prefer to feed or hunt at dawn or at twilight, at dusk. Others prefer to hunt during the day. Lions, often you see them hunting at night. Your leopards, and your, we'll, you'll see them hunting during the day when it's easy to see, the, uh, to see the prey. So you'll find that they share a similar area, but they're able to share the resources by hunting at different times. Okay, so we, we're going to go for a break, guys, and we're going to come back. We're going to look at some more questions. So stretch a bit, come back with your notes, and we'll work with some more questions. Welcome back guys, hope you guys have had a nice stretch and refreshed. Let's go on with question 3. Again, it's lots of repetition of questions, a very important terminology. I'll try and whiz past them because we've got to deal with some more important questions. But again, let's look at them quickly. We'll spend a few minutes on, on this question. To study, in the, study the diagrams below and name this type of social organization and its benefit to the population. So if we look at this here, Okay, so we're seeing four different images here. Here we're seeing fish that are shoaling, which basically means swimming together. We also see some zebras that are in a herd together. And here at the bottom we see a pack of wild dogs hunting cooperatively together. And there we see four di three different types of bees. Now basically this sh speaks about, these images speak about social organization or the way societies are, are, are organized so that they function efficiently so that their survival chances increase. Here if we look at fish, they try and arrange themselves. If you look at this here guys, it's very confusing. To a predator, he's not going to know which fish to single out. So this arrangement helps, often confuses the predators. It's also about making it very difficult to single out a single individual. If you look at the zebras guys, and if you were to try and find and count how many here, that's one, two, three, four, five. It's not really you're not really going to be able to count exactly if you look at a herd of them. So again, the predator is going to look at them. The stripes, when they all decide to run in different directions, confuses them. And hence, this would be trying to confuse the predator by their herding pack, herding arrangement. Here, if we look at wild dogs, they are cooperatively hunting. So here you've got them. You often have the alpha male and alpha female that run alongside. They tie the zebra down. And here you find one of the others going for the kill. But this is in terms of cooperatively hunting to ensure the greatest success of their hunt. Here we've got three different types of bees. And this is the caste system that we see in ants. We see this in bees. And basically the caste system means you've got individuals that carry out specific functions. And that's division of labor to ensure the survival of that society. So that's a nice question that you need to look at. Again, here we're seeing a typical prey predator graph guys so lots of questions based on this it often talks about the relationship between a predator and a prey you're going to see lots of similar graphs you've got to interpret the two graphs i'm going to very quickly go through the graph i'm going to highlight one of them in yellow very quickly and the other in maybe let's use green and that is the graph here okay just to enhance the visual appearance of this. And here we see the x-axis showing you the prey. And here on the y-axis, we're showing you the predator. And very quickly looking at this graph, and often learners are confused as to determine which is the prey, which is the predator. And often remember that the predator is a larger animal, and there are fewer of them. The prey are the smaller animals, and there are more of them. And hence, in terms of their numbers, here you're going to see the prey are 1,200 from 300 to 1,200 and the predator from 5 to 25. So obviously the numbers are disproportionate in terms of due to their size. So name the type of interaction illustrated by this graph. I'm going to very quickly go through this. And that basically refers to the prey-predator relationship that we see and that we've been talking about. So it's a relationship between <coughs> a prey and a predator. Let's see. Provide the complete scientific name for the prey. And if we go to the graph, guys, here we'll see the complete scientific name for the predator and the prey. So that you can get from your graph very quickly. We've got to also provide the complete scientific name for the predator and the prey. 
very quickly you can refer to the graphs along the x-axis and the y-axis guys you can find that so you got to look you're not expected to remember these names or know them but what the examiner wants to do is see whether you can access that information and distinguish between which is the prey and which is the predator what is the number of prey at week five and this is often a type of question that you can expect so the number of prey on this axis so we've got to look at the yellow line there and determine that at week five it was approximately around a hundred okay so plus minus around a hundred what is the number of predator at week 55 so if we go back to the graph at week 55 here we go all the way up okay so let's look at we're going to use another color all the way up there we're going to go across there so it's approximately 15 so so it's plus minus 15 okay so we're looking at an answer there of 15 and here we looked at an answer of approximately it was a hundred okay so describe and explain the pattern shown in the interaction in the graph and these are the questions that basically if you look at the graph here you see that the predator population increases as the prey population increases and uh, when the prey predator population gets to a certain point which is exceeds the carrying capacity there's not enough prey for the predator population to sustain their growth and hence you see that the prey population starts to decrease so if we look at the interaction here you find that the predators depend on the prey when their numbers exceed far beyond the the carrying capacity of that environment the prey population increases when the prey population increases the predators do not have resources and hence their population decreases. and hence you see that decrease in the population they then decrease allowing the predators to re-establish themselves and hence the predator pop the prey population re-establish and you see this in a cyclic basis so you can see clearly see one increasing the other decreasing and this happens because of the inter interdependence on each other for food Again, similar questions, guys. Study the diagrams below and name the type of competition with reason. So we're talking about the type of competition here. Here we're looking at lions, so it's intraspecific. Here we're looking at lions and hyenas, and so that's different species. Again, intra interspecific, and here it was intra, and here it is interspecific. So we got competition between the different species and here between the same species okay let's move on to the study the diagrams below and name the type of social interaction illustrated briefly describe the relationship here we seeing a mosquito on human skin and that would be a parasite so it's parasitism and here we seeing a nest on a tree where the nest benefits or the bird benefits from living on a tree and that we ref and the tree is not harmed and that we refer to as common cellism the benefit of one while the other is neither harmed nor benefited let's move on to question number four and this is a very important question because we often talk about the process of change in an environment and refer to that as succession there are two types of succession that occurs primary succession and secondary succession so you look at the look at the diagram and try and establish whether there was life form in it before before or it is the first form of forms of life that existed and established that environment here if you look at this diagram we're seeing rock in the first di set of diagrams we're seeing soil we're seeing some plants and shrubs and then we're seeing some taller plants and more well-developed plants okay so let's look at what the question is what biological process is illustrated above and as I said series of diagrams showing the process of change from one from simple to complex is referred to as succession and if you ask to describe the type of succession here I would say it is primary because there's clear evidence that this was rock and it was established from it establishes soil in the next diagram so it simply means that there was no previous life forms here differentiate between primary and secondary versions of the above mentioned process as I mentioned primary is when an ecosystem or an environment establishes itself from uh, from simple rock where there's lichens that establish the environment rocks degraded and obviously the plants de decomposed and improved the nutritional value which then started supporting more complex organisms as compared to secondary succession which is in an area where life forms existed in areas wiped out it often happens because of felt fires or even if uh, a mine dump 
a mine was uh, sort of sand was dumped into a mine there would be some sort of seeds on there some sort of ability for that soil to support life and that would be secondary succession let's look at the third question what do we call the first species that occupies barren or bare soil now this refers to the individuals that establish their environment and often we refer to in history you talk about individuals that came to an area and settled and established that as pioneers and we use the same term these were the pioneer species so organisms that establish an area are referred to as the pioneer species because they are the first to establish and live in that area so quite a nice short simple question but lots of information for you to uh, access let's look at question number five study the diagram below and answer the questions that follow now this obviously shows you a graph it's time on the x-axis and on the y-axis we see population numbers and very quickly you're seeing a graph that shows a sort of a an s-shaped or a logistic growth curve let's look at the questions that follow identify the growth form illustrated in the above so that type of graph guys when we look at it we are seeing a gradual lag phase and then an increase and then obviously fluctuating around the carrying capacity and this type of graph is referred to as a logistic growth curve or if you said an s shape you would be correct okay let's look at more questions on this identify the phases labeled a to d well we cannot see the phases here but if i were to quickly labeled a b c and d we can quickly refer to a to d as a would be i'm going to call that the lag phase b would be the exponential phase C would be the decelerated growth phase and D would be the equilibrium phase where the growth is fluctuating around the carrying capacity so if we were we have identified that briefly explain phase A so if we look at phase A which is the lag phase guys the lag phase is the so the lag phase if we very quickly refer to the lag phase the lag phase is in any population in any environment individuals that are introduced into an area need to establish themselves they need to familiarize themselves with the environment and that process is called acclimatization or getting used to their surroundings often they're establishing they're getting used to the new resources they're establishing they're becoming mature so that they can reproduce and the growth in during that phase is fairly slow because they're placed into a new environment, they're establishing a sense of territory for themselves, they're getting used to the types, the new type of food, as well as they're maturing and becoming adults. And that is the reason why you find the growth is very slow. So we've explained briefly, so it's establishing to the new establishing, acclimatizing themselves in the new environment, becoming reproductively mature and uh, getting used to their new surroundings. Which phase is not illustrated above? Okay, so if you look at that graph, guys, the phase that is not illustrated above would be the phase where the graph starts to decrease. And that phase is the phase of extinction. The extinction phase, guys, would be when the population decreases and there's a drastic decrease in the population. And that would be the extinction phase. Let's look at more questions that are based on graphs. The graph below shows the number of bacteria growing in the nutrient medium in a nutrient medium which is kept at a constant optimum temperature for a period of 30 hours okay so we've seen that here we're seeing the growth and again we're seeing that growth gradual increase and then stabilizing and becoming constant and then slightly decreasing let's look at the questions that are based on this how many bacteria were present at 10 hours so if we go to the graph guys if we go back to the graph at 10 hours let's look at we've got to take take your rulers guys you've got to draw your lines use a ruler plot it on the 10 hours see where it intercepts the the graph and then read off the y-axis now lots of the learners are going to say one but if you look at the scale on the x-axis it says one which is thousand per millimeter cubed so the answer here would be it's one thousand per millimeter cubed and that's often and you're going to tend to lose a mark 
if you say one which is actually an incorrect value as you've not read of the unit on the y-axis from the fifth hour how long did it take the bacteria population to double in size so if we look at the fifth hour how long does it take for the population size to double in size okay so if we look at that graph again very quickly from the fifth hour how long did it take for the population size to double so it starts doubling it basically takes so here it is there and then it doubles to that so that's five here if we look at halfway there so it's about 2.5 there it's about 5 so how long did it take from 2.5 to get to 5 and that interval would be about 2.5 hours so you've got to look at the period establish what its population initially was which is about uh, 0.2 which is about 0.25 which is about 250 per in per millimeter cube and here at 5 hours uh, at about 7.5 hours it became about 0.75 which is about 50 percent more and hence the answer there would be it took about 2.5 hours for the population to double after five hours the next question at which of the following time periods was the growth rate the greatest write only the letter of your choice if we look at the graph again guys at which time was the growth rate the, the greatest okay if you look at the, the I'm going to clear up the graph for you so that we make it a bit clearer okay if we look at the growth rate during this period that is from 5 from 10 hours to about 15 hours a little more than that you find that there has been an exponential growth increase so if we look at the options that are given for us in that it's 0 to 5 hours no that's the lag phase if we go to 5 to 10 hours not really it's still at the early start of the exponential phase but during this phase during 10 to 15 hours and as I showed you this there's been an exponential increase in the growth rate and during the last segment during that you found that the population actually decreases so the answer here would be C would be the correct answer okay let's move on to give a possible reason for the increase in growth rate for the period mentioned in this so the period mentioned here so we mentioned that the growth rate increases exponentially here what is the reason so that is this is the phase during which when the individuals are mature they are have adapted to the new environment there are lots of reproductively fertile uh, individuals so that they can reproduce and increase exponentially the, there's lots of resources available and hence they can increase exponentially and hence you find that the rapid rate of growth is exponential let's look at the next question for how many hours was the population of bacteria found to have been above 4000 show your calculations so above 4000 if we go back to the graph above 4000 so we're going to look at we're looking at I'm going to very clearly clear the graph for you Okay, so above 4,000 would be, we got to look at when was the population above 4,000. So it was between 30 hours and between about, so if we bring this down, we've got to extrapolate down there. It's about 14 hours. So basically we've got to subtract 30 minus, okay, so I'm going to get my pen to work again, minus 14, which is about 16 hours. So basically it was above 4,000 for about 16 hours so the answer there would be 16 hours let's look at question 6 question 6 refers to uh, an experiment that was carried out an experiment was carried out remember that you find often you'll get your experimental design questions where you ask to analyze the experiment to determine the independent variables the dependent variables. so this is a quite an interesting question where we're looking at a kind of survey that was done so the indigenous ro rodent population that occupied the area before the arrival of aliens had been controlled naturally by predators mostly by birds of prey the alien mice were smaller and better camouflaged which basically means that they were less visible than the indigenous rodents so the indigenous rodents the word indig indigenous basically means rodents that naturally lived in that area 
and obviously your alien would be ones that have come in and they could have been carried in by during importing of, of food grains that they, were car they, that they came in accidentally when they were trapped in the bags and when they got into this area they were they, when they released from these bags they obviously then got into the land they've multiplied but they've been better camouflaged than the indigenous rod rodents which simply means that the likelihood of seeing an alien by a predator is less than seeing an indigenous rodent. So let's read on. The populations of indigenous mice and other rodents dropped dramatically after the alien mice arrived. Why? Because the natural birds of prey were able to pick out the indigenous rats, much rodents, much more easily than the alien species. This simply meant that the alien species were able to reproduce faster because they were not easily attacked by the predators. The indigenous birds did not prey on the alien mice, as I said, and began to emigrate from the area. In an attempt to encourage predation by owls, a scientist and her students from a university conducted an experiment. They caught alien mice, they marked them with yellow luminescent paint, and then released them into the environment. So what they did was, they wanted to carry out an investigation to see whether making these alien mice a bit more visible by using luminous paint. Now luminous paint basically refers to paint that is that will appear more um, more easily during the dark. So it's sort of brighter in the dark. So if you think about a bird of prey like an owl should be attracted to organisms that are more brightly colored at night because it makes them more easily visible. So the scientists tried to do an experiment where they painted these, they caught a few of these alien mice, marked them with some yellow luminous paint and then released them in the hope that they would, the, they would be more easily visible by the owls. Let's see what happened. Okay, so a few questions based on this experiment. The question is, why did the population of indigenous mice and rodents decrease? And that's obviously, if we go back to the, the population of indigenous mice and other rodents dropped dr dramatically after the alien mice has arrived. The reason, we need to know why. So if you look at this, the alien mice were competing with the indigenous mice for food. So the indigenous mice obviously that lived in there were not, did not have access to food as easily as well as they were more easily visible by the owl because they were indigenous, they did not have a natural mechanism of camouflage as compared to the alien ones and hence it was lack of resources as well as they were more easily picked on by the owls. Let's see that why did the birds of prey leave the area? And eventually what happens? When organisms find that there's a lack of resources, especially birds, they will emigrate, they will move out of an area in search of better pastures, in search of more resources. So exactly, when the population of um, indigenous rodents, the, the rodents that naturally lived in that area decreased, the, the, the owls were not able to sustain their demands for food and hence they decided to move out. So the birds of prey, example with the, the natural birds that lived in that area, moved out to other areas where there were more resources and that was the reason why they actually moved on. Why did the scientists decide to use yellow luminous paints to mark the alien mice? So the intention of this was basically to paint them with a luminous paint and as I said luminous would mean that it sort of appears, it highlights the mice at night and the idea was made possibly to see if the owls would be able to pick up these uh, alien mice more easily. We're not too sure if they were successful as we don't have enough of detail. But the idea was to see, to increase the appearance of the alien mice at night, at night and see what would the effectiveness of being more brightly colored have on or more visible have on the possibility of them being attacked by the owls. Okay, so the alien mice was painted luminous to make them more yellow, m to make them more visible at night. Okay, let's see. The Innovate this innovative experiment in which the mice were painted was a complete failure. What were the scientists trying to achieve and why do you think the experiment failed? And that's often a question that you would get. Why analyze the experiment? And here the question is why did it fail? So and obviously you cannot paint an animal with a paint that will affect its lifestyle. And this probably meant that the paint could have been toxic, it could have it could have changed the natural behavior of the animal and that is very important when you're marking and tagging individuals is that the paint or the tag should not affect the behavior 
it should not affect the interaction of that mice with the others. So it probably was toxic, it probably affected the behavior of the mice and that is why it was a complete failure. They would then need to look at some alternative uh, methods of tagging them. Let's move on to the last question. Using examples, describe predation, competition and symbiosis. Explaining how each interaction influences the population size of the organisms involved. So very important guys, there's quite a, it's quite a complex instruction. Using examples, that's the first one. Number two, we've got to describe and number three, we've got to explain. So we've got to do three things for each of these examples. So we've got predation, competition and symbiosis. We've got to do for each using an example. So we've got a given example. We've got to describe each of those relation, each of those concepts. So we've got to describe predation, competi uh, competition, as well as symbiosis, and we've got to explain how these interactions influence the population size. So for each one of them, we've got to describe them, we've got to explain them using examples, and we've got to talk about the interaction affecting the population size. It's very important for you, you to be able to unpack the question before you attempt the essay, and hence you've got to do some planning. Very quickly, so the, as I've said, I've got down three points for each one of them. Let's look at a, a suggested answer which I've got up here for you guys. And very quickly, we can look at how you should lay out a response for this. So as I said, for each one of them, we've got to describe the interaction, the, the example, and what it would have on the population. So the first example we're looking at is predation and you've got to describe what predation is. Predation is basically a predator which captures and kills the prey and an example of that there's lots of examples you can talk about lions you can talk about lions and their prey you can talk about uh, leopards you can talk about wild dogs you can talk about hyenas as well and the examples you'll get a mark for giving an example a relevant example that's important and you can describe the interaction on the population so the prey population will decrease when the predator population will increase. So as the number of predators increase, the prey population will decrease. So you should be able to give that. The next part of the essay was you had to describe competition. So let's look at competition. So in competition, guys, there's lots of concepts here in competition. We've discussed different types of competition. So the first thing you're going to describe is what interspecific competition is. And in interspecific competition, you're going to describe what happens in interspecific competition where large number of organisms of different species depend on the same resources. Example, flower beetles, and you can talk about the effect. So one species will decrease in the population while the other will increase. The other type of competition we just need to discuss is, I'm going to highlight in the different color, would be intraspecific competition. Okay, and for that you explain what happens. This is when organisms of the same species depend on the same resource and we can give an example of that would be flower beetles and one species decrease while the other will increase okay let's look at symbiosis the other example that we need to talk about or the interaction we need to talk about is symbiosis in symbiosis guys we've got to talk about the various relationships in that number one is parasitism we've got to give an example of that and explain the other example is mutualism, again a type of symbiotic relationship. We can also talk about commensalism, which is the third relationship. And for each one of them, guys, we've spent some time describing an example here. We spoke about for parasitism, it's the tapon and humans. It could be mosquitoes uh, and humans. Uh, an example of mutualism is bacteria and the roots of leguminous plants. And an example of commensalism is sharks and the remora fish, or you can talk about the birds in the nest. And you've got to talk about for each one the, the relationship or the, eff the effect of what one has on the population. You know that parasitism will cause one population to decrease and the other to increase. Mutualism, both benefit in this, both in populations increase. Commensalism, one would be unaffected while the other benefits and hence you'll see an increase in the population. So we co we've come to the end of the session. We've ended off with the essay. It's very important for you to guys to do a very quick, brief draft plan of your essay. Break that essay down into what the examiner exactly wants you to answer. 
put those thoughts down briefly before you actually attempt to synthesize your essay. Guys, we have, this is a wrap. We've looked at population ecology today. We've spent lots of time looking at the basic terminology, lots of vocab. Put all those concepts together, you'll be able to write a very good essay. Lots of the questions that come on this are data response relate to different uh, case studies. You should be able to apply those valuable concepts and terminology into the questions and be able to extract the answers out. From my side, enjoy your rest of your day. Work hard, work smart, and do well.